Well, this is our third week in Daniel 7, and as I said earlier, there are three clear divisions in this chapter. We looked at the first two, and tonight we're going to go to the third one. The section we'll be looking at tonight is an expansion of Daniel's vision of the little horn, or more correctly, we could say that the vision continues, but Daniel gets the opportunity to ask questions and get some more information. In verse 16, there is the interesting inclusion of a visionary bystander. Now, I don't know about you, but in my dreams, it is not very often I get to ask questions of others standing by. And of course, this is a literary device to give us more information as we read this. But look at verse 16. Daniel says, I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. <clears throat> the visionary bystander is going to give us some information we didn't previously have. In fact, he's going to give us really a concise summary in verses 17 and 18. <clears throat> and then he's going to give us an expanded explanation in verses 23 through 27. And this is all bracketed with two verses describing Daniel's distress, one at the beginning of this section and one at the end. But let's back up for a moment. <clears throat> Let me remind you of the basic outline for this chapter. In verses 1 through 8, we saw the fearful face of history. <clears throat> In verses 9 through 14, <clears throat> excuse me, we saw the firm foundation of history. And now in verses 15 through 28, we'll see the future formulation of history. So that's the main outline uh, for the chapter. We're in that last section. So in essence, we're in point three of our main outline, which is the future formulation of history. This last section from verse 15 down to verse 28 does not deal with the fourth beast. It deals with the future aspect of the fourth beast. It is a lengthy section, but it divides naturally into six parts. So that's how we're going to see it tonight. The first thing we see is what I'm calling the alarm, the alarm. And as I said, the alarm really forms the bracket around this passage. We see it expressed at the beginning and again at the end. I mean, look at verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. In the words of the late, great Elvis Presley, Daniel was all shook up. He was distressed in his inner being. These visions were disturbing him. There was an alarm going off in his mind. And now drop down to verse 28. At this point, the revelation ended. And as for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me. And my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. He so alarmed, all the color left his face. He looked like a ghost. What did he do? He just kept it all to himself. Well, that is until he was inspired by God to put it in this book so we could know about it. And praise God, he didn't remain silent forever. This did not remain a secret. 
it was revealed to us. So thankfully, we now have a copy of this vision, <clears throat> and that is vitally important because it reveals much of God's plans for the future. And we're going to see a lot <clears throat> here in regard to the future. We get information from this passage that we don't get anywhere else. And as I have already pointed out, verse 16 tells us how Daniel got this information. I mean, look again at verse 16. I approached one of those who were standing by <clears throat> and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Now, who is this? We don't know. We're not told. But remember, this was a dream. I mean, can you go up to some unnamed person in a dream and ask for an interpretation? Well, apparently, in a divine dream, you can. Daniel did. And lo and behold, he got an answer. And of course, all of this is really a literary device. It is the way in which apocalyptic material communicates God's message. And this interpretation is really the revelation of God to Daniel. God is explaining to Daniel what this is all about. <clears throat> but it's as if Daniel is asking questions in his dream and getting answers. So we begin with the alarm. But in verses 17 and 18, he gives us a summary of what he is communicating. So I'm calling this the explanation. <clears throat> Let's read it, and then we'll come back and examine it. We read it a while ago, but here's what it says. Verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. <clears throat> But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom <clears throat> and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. There you go. That's the explanation. We can all go home. Everyone have a great week. Just kidding. You know me better than that. In fact, what we have in verses 17 and 18 is just a summary. But Daniel will not be content with that. <clears throat> he will press for more information, but let's even break this summary down a bit. First of all, understand that with this explanation, we have no excuse for not understanding what this vision means. You know, people talk about how hard it is to understand apocalyptic prophetic sections of scripture but most of the time as it is here they come with very clear explanations so we really can't read verses 17 and 18 and then say we don't really know what it means it may be apocalyptic but it is reasonably clear this is the gist of it this is the summary of what God is going to do in the future. We don't have to guess what this vision means. We're clearly told that the four beasts represent four kings. And we're told that these four kings will arise from the earth at some point in history and that ultimately the saints of God are going to receive an eternal kingdom. We know that. It is clear. And let me just throw another by the way in here. If this was all we knew about in times, it would be enough. In fact, all we really need to know is that we win out in the end, right? Kings can come and go, and nations can rise and rise up against other nations, but 
in the end, we know we will rule and reign with Christ forever. And isn't that all we really need to know? And we really could just stop right there. But like Daniel, we're curious to know more. And so God, in his grace, provides us with some additional information. And we're going to see that additional information as we go on down in this chapter. <clears throat> but before we leave this summary, there's something else I really need to deal with here. There has been some debate among scholars over what the phrase the saints of the highest one refers to in verse 18. The word saints is the Aramaic word Kaddish, and it can refer to human saints or to angels. So some Bible scholars hold that <clears throat> these are angels here and not believers. However, most Bible scholars take this to refer to human believers, and I share that view. And one of the main reasons why I believe that is because down in verse 25, it says, he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, I don't know of anyone who thinks he's referring to angels here, even though he uses the very same word here. It is clear that this is something that is going to be happening on the earth and that it is going to be happening to human saints. And so I take this reference in verse 18 to point to the faithful people on earth who belong to God. In fact, we know this is a reference to people here and not to angels because verse 27 says, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole earth will be given to what? The people of the saints of the highest one. It's going to be given to people. So this is clearly referring to people. It's clear in the text. The Aramaic word am is clearly people and not angels. So the saints of the highest one in verse 18 are God's believing people who are living on the earth at the time when the little horn takes over. They are the ones who will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Well, this is all good information to have, but Daniel is not completely satisfied at this point. He wants to know more. So in verses 19 and 20, we have the additional inquiry. The additional inquiry. Look with me at verse 19. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts and which was larger in appearance than its associates. Daniel wanted to know more. <clears throat> he was curious, especially about the fourth beast and the horns, in particular the little horn. By the way, much of what we see in Daniel, we also see in the book of Revelation. For example, turn with me for a moment to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. <clears throat> Verse 
In Revelation 17, verse 16, we have an explanation of these horns. <coughs> Revelation 17, verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. Now, you have to know who the harlot is, but here you see these same ten horns referred to at the end of the age. The ten horns will be prominent when the great harlot is deposed. By the way, in case you're wondering, the great harlot will be the false religious system the Antichrist will use to unite the whole world. But going back to Daniel 7, verse 21 takes us into the next section, which I am calling the additional information. The additional information. Back in Daniel 7, look with me at verse 21. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. What horn is that? Well, the other horn, the little horn, the one who pulled up three of the horns from their roots, the one who has eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts. Who is this? There's no doubt about it. This is the Antichrist. He is the one Paul called the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. He's the one that is called the Antichrist in 1 John 2, verse 18. He will start off as a little horn, but he will grow. At this point, he is larger in appearance than his associates. He will start off as a little horn, but now he has taken over the whole world. And none of the other horns dares to stand against him. Indeed, a time is coming when there will be a future king that will make Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus look like kindergartners. No one will cause terror like this little horn. And please understand, the little horn does not stay little. He refers to him that way because that's how he was at the beginning, but he grows to an enormous size. And the increase in his size is even reflected in verse 8 where it says, he came up among the others. He will grow to the point where he can overpower three of the other horns and pull them up by their roots, assuming that these are the most powerful three horns among the ten. In fact... A detail that you may have missed in verse 20 says, this horn was larger in appearance than its associates. By the time he wages war against the saints of God, he will be so large the others will pale in comparison. In fact, we know from Scripture his reign will be worldwide in scope. Now, all of this is new information. Daniel gives us things about this guy we never knew before. He's going to make war with the saints, and initially, at least, he's going to overpower them. Now, this is a great news scoop, but Daniel is still not satisfied. He still wants to know more. So in verses 23 through 27, we find the additional explanation. Look with me at verse 23. Thus, he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. 
The picture here is worldwide domination. This kingdom will devour the whole earth. And we're, we, we've already seen that <clears throat> the fourth beast represents Rome. So this will be connected to the Roman Empire. But the, te the, te <clears throat> excuse me, the text, <clears throat> try that one more time. The text says, makes it clear that this will be the future form of that kingdom. This is not the ancient kingdom of Rome. This is a future form of the Roman kingdom. <clears throat> it will be during the time in which the little horn pulls up the other three horns. That's the time frame. Look at verse 24. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. Now what does this indicate? <clears throat> It tells us the relationship between these ten kings is going to be fragile at best. Dr. Davis writes, evil can never manufacture enough glue to keep itself together. It has no lasting cohesion. The dissension always seems to surface. And that will be the case here as well. And remember, the vision here in chapter 7 correlates with the vision of the statue in chapter 2. The same kingdoms are pictured. And we see the same fragile elements there. In that vision, the clay and the iron don't mix together very well. Remember that? Here's what it says in Chapter 2, in fact, turn back with me to chapter 2 and look at verse 41. Chapter 2, verse 41. And in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. It's going to be a fragile kingdom. There's going to be dissension. There's going to be strife in this future kingdom. And this evil regime may crush the world with its awesome power, but it will still have cracks in its foundation. And it will be filled with conflict and disunity. The iron part of the kingdom will be extremely powerful, but the part, the pottery aspect will be weak. Nevertheless, we're told, it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. And verse 25 adds another detail. And he, the little horn, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. The Antichrist will not only stand against Christ, he will speak out against the Most High God. And we saw that his mouth will be full of blasphemy and his hatred of God will parallel his hatred of God's people and he will carry out severe persecution against the saints of the Most High. Verse 21 has really already prepared us for this. And by the way, this severe persecution from the little horn falls under the sovereign control of God. This is all part of God's plan. The phrase, they will be 
given into his hand in verse 25 implies they are given by God. God is the one who allows all of this. And so even though this persecution will not necessarily be a good thing, it is strangely comforting to know that God is still in control even in this. Even God will allow this persecution to take place. Now, if we go to Revelation 13, we find very similar terminology referring to the same person. Turn with me for a moment to Revelation 13. And you could call this the divine permissive. It reflects the fact that God often uses even Satan for his own purposes. So Revelation 13, and look with me at verse 5. And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. What's the implication here? It is given by God the authority which he will possess temporarily upon the earth. He's going to be given exactly 42 months or three and a half years. So God is going to grant the little horn the authority to rule the earth for three and a half years. Look at verse 7. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over Every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And again, notice the phrase, it was given to him. He's, go he's going to be granted by God the authority to rule over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. Drop down to verse 15. Notice what it says here. And there was given to him breath to the image of the beast... It was, excuse me, let me start over. And there was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now you have to know a little bit about the image of the beast and what's going on there, but amazingly, God is even going to allow this little horn to have the power to breathe life into the image and cause it to come alive. And he's going to grant him the authority to kill those who don't worship the image of the beast. Now, thankfully, his power is going to be limited. He's going to be given this authority for a certain amount of time. <clears throat> going back to Daniel 7, 25, they, that is the saints of the Most High, will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying three and a half years. This will be the last half of the seven-year tribulation period. The persecution will be short, but it will be severe. The good news is that it will all end in victory. I mean, look with me at verse 26. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Boom! Boom! Just like that, he's gone. He's gone. By the way, according to my eschatology, we won't be there for any of this. The rapture of the church will take place at the beginning of the tribulation period. So this involves those who still remain upon the earth during this time, not the church. But look at verse 27. Notice what it says, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one, 
and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. That will be the end of the matter. This is how it will all turn out. The people of the highest one will rule and reign with him forever. And the Son of Man will come and deal with the little horn once and for all. And that will be the end of the kingdom of men. The eternal kingdom of God will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one and they will serve him forever. So that's how it all turns out. It's a good ending, right? But before we wrap things up for tonight, I just want to go back to verse 25 for a moment. Verse 25 is a very interesting verse. And it has given rise to a lot of speculation in regard to end times. Look at it with me. And he, that is the Antichrist, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. By the way, any of you saints starting to feel kind of worn down a little bit? I mean, maybe it's already started. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. Notice that phrase right in the middle of that verse. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law. Isn't that interesting? Do you know anyone today that is making alterations in times and laws? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Joe Biden is the Antichrist or Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer. But it is interesting that everything we have known for decades now is being thrown out the window and new laws are being made. And this, of course, will not just be the case in the United States, but when Antichrist comes, it will be worldwide. It will be all over the world. Laws are going to be changed and times are going to be changed to accommodate the rise of this new world leader. And I don't know about you, but it has been shocking to me to see how fast the entire world has caved in to the dictates of a few over the COVID issue. And I'm not saying that this is the mark of the beast, but I am saying it is likely a precursor to it. We are being conditioned to yield our freedoms to the rule of a world dictator. We are being set up. We are being prepared. That is the world as a whole. And listen, it is working big time, big time. Now, the Great Reset is a term that is used by the World Economic Forum and it represents a global transformation, not only of the world economy, but of every aspect of life as we know it. And I won't go into the details of that tonight, but suffice it to say that there are very powerful people behind the scenes with insane amounts of money that are planning our future. They're planning our future right now. And I won't speculate tonight as to the exact laws that will be changed by the Antichrist. But what I do know is that these changes will be for one single reason, control, control. Laws and systems of government will be changed to allow the Antichrist to control every aspect of life. And, and you know as well as I do that much of this 
surveillance power is already in place. It's already in place. We know that. I mean, there are ca cameras everywhere. It, we're being tracked with every device we have. And as we live in the year 2021, it is not that difficult to imagine a world where everything is controlled by one single man. Not hard at all. This powerful man will one day take his place in history. I'm not saying he's here yet. I don't know. But his reign may not be that far away. It may be very soon. And I'll close with this. There's an old legend that describes Satan in a meeting with all his demons. He wanted to send one of them to the earth to aid men and women in the ruination of their souls. So he asked for volunteers. One creature came forward and said, I will go. Satan said, if I send you, what will you tell the children of men? He said, I will tell the children of men there is no heaven. Satan said, they will not believe you, for there is a bit of heaven in every human heart. In the end, everyone knows that right and good must have the victory. You may not go. Then another came forward, darker and fouler than the first. And Satan said, if I send you, what will you tell the children of men? He said, I will tell them there is no hell. Satan looked at him and said, oh no, they will not believe you. For in every human heart, there's a thing called conscience, an inner voice, which testifies to the truth that not only will good be triumphant, but that evil will be defeated. No, you may not go. Then one last creature came forward, and this one was from the darkest place of all. And Satan said to him, if I send you what will you say to men and women to aid them in the destruction of their souls? He said, I will tell them there is no hurry. And Satan said, go, go. People always assume we have plenty of time. But it sure seems to me the time is growing short. And I am here to tell you this evening, there is not plenty of time. The stage is set for the end time events exactly as described in biblical prophecy and the time is short. If you believe the lie that there's plenty of time to commit your life to Christ or there's plenty of time to tell your friends about Jesus, then you may never get to it before it is eternally too late. If you really believe the little horn could take the reins of this world very soon, then you should do all you can to live for Christ now. Now. I would say, rather than saying there's plenty of time, I would say the time is urgent, is urgent. And of course, in my eschatology, we will be long gone before the events of Daniel 7 unfold, but that just means the time is even shorter. So let's make sure we're using our time to the fullest for his purpose. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this evening that you would help us to just have that sense of urgency, that we would understand we don't have all the time in the world. This, we, we may have very little time left. And Lord, we acknowledge we don't understand uh, exactly who is going to be involved and, and when that person's going to come on the scenes. But Lord, we do see a lot of things in place. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have wisdom and discernment in a time like this, that we might be urgent, that we might be about your business, that we might not waste any precious time, but that we might be 
on business for you. Help us with that this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.